I'm Keon. And this is Trust Your Doctor, that podcast where we listen to audio dramas. Uh, because this time, we listen to Find and Replace. Written by Paul Mars. And it was directed by Lisa Bowerman. And released in September 2010. Great. Uh, I thought it was Paul, like, Madgers or something like that, but apparently it's Mars. Yeah, uh, I also <laughs> thought that, but... Um, the release came with a little like eight minute interview at the end of the uh, the story, and in it, uh, I think either Katie Manning or, or Lisa is like, "Yeah, Paul Mars, thanks for writing such a great story." <laughs> it's like, oh, uh, so it's pronounced like Mars, like Mars Bar. Got it. <laughs> right. Well, we should probably explain what this is. I was just so eager to uh, to, to to clear that up. Uh, uh, but <laughs> my bad. <laughs> no, I'm sure anyway. there, are, there are tons of people out there like, how do you pronounce that? Because they just never heard it pronounced out loud. <laughs> I I, it suppose. is an interesting spelling, I'd, I'd say. But yeah. Anyway, uh, yes, of course, is. we. this is different. You know, normally on Trust Your Doctor, we watch classic Doctor Who, but. Yeah. Uh, this audio drama was on sale. Big Finish does this thing every month where they pick a title related to a major release from that month and they discount it down to. Three dollars for download. Um, it's called the listeners, and they try to get people listening to some of their older releases through this. Mm-hmm. So uh, this month, it just so happened. This is August 2015, by the way. That it just so happened, a new Iris Wildtime release was coming. So they chose this audio drama, Find and Replace, to discount, which just also so happened to be a third Doctor and Joe Grant uh, audio drama. Right, and um, so we decided to do it. You know, why yeah, not? Why not? Um, Nothing to lose. Plus, it's apparently a pretty mostly well-liked well, story yeah the the res- i mean i read a couple of reviews of this after listening to it mm-hmm. they seemed pretty mi- you know not professional I mean, reviews but just like mixed pe- pe- blogs people have or whatever it seemed yeah. pretty mixed mixed to really. positive i'd say yeah i'd say mostly positive but then some completely negative ones <laughs> and i mean i'll say right off the bat that i liked part one of this mm-hmm. and then part two i think fell pretty flat Really, I didn't really like where, where I think they the, took it. In the part writing two. of part two was a little bit iffy, but I liked some of the things that Joe said, uh, which we'll get to in a second when we explain the plot. Like we always do in this show. Yep. But before we do that, we should explain uh, kind of how this type of audio drama worked. Uh, this is a range called the Companion Chronicles, which is really Big Finish's way of using actors who played the companions of Doctors who are dead now. Um, so that, using the actors who played those companions to tell more stories that didn't appear on screen. Right, and of course, this being both a Joe Grant story and an Iris Wild Time story mm-hmm. is narrated by Katie Manning. Right. You know, really no one else to do this. I'd be surprised yeah. if it wasn't narrated by her. Yeah, so she <laughs> plays Joe and Iris uh, in this story. Yep. Rather impressively, I might add, we'll talk about her acting at the end, I think. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that that was one of the highlights of this, actually. And uh, then it also co-stars, uh, God, I Alex, La- uh, Alex Lowe. Alex Lowe as, as Huxley. Uh, Huxley. Uh, I think the name Huxley is definitely supposed to be a reference to, uh, what's his name, who wrote Brave New World? Hmm. His name, I think that the author's name of who wrote Brave New World is like yeah. Aldous Huxley yeah, or something. Al- yeah, yes. Um, I think that's supposed to be a reference, possibly. Mm. It would make sense. I've never read the book and I don't even know what it's about, so. Neither do I, but I think uh, just the fact of him being a famous author... Yeah, I suppose, yeah. Um, so anyway, I guess we'll just jump into explaining the plot, and then we can talk about the particulars later. Yep. Uh, so it begins with Joe Grant, obviously, talking about how there was she was doing a Christmas shopping on Christmas Eve uh, 2010, because this was released in 2010. Right, so cl- obviously long after she's gone her separate ways with the Doctor and mm-hmm. Unit. Yeah, um, many years. Yeah, she... Uh, Sort of reminisces, I think, about the '70s a, a, a little bit at the beginning, and then definitely, yeah. more, definitely more later. But <laughs> I think she brings it up even before you know the conflict mm-hmm. starts. Yeah, um, which it starts almost immediately. Which I mean, I liked that. It didn't really beat around the bush or anything. <laughs> There's just a few lines of uh, narration there, and then she uh, she walks into an elevator at a uh, where she, uh, she's at Selfridges. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> She walks into this elevator, and there's there's another guy in there. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just going down, and then it breaks down. Yep. Don't you always hate when that happens? It's never happened to me. Oh, really? <laughs> Has it happened to you? Yeah, well, for like, not not for an extended period of time, but like, you know, an elevator is huh. 
stuff. Yeah, I think I, it, in, in, in my childhood, I don't <laughs> I don't remember. It wasn't like two weeks ago where I'm like, darn, darn it, I have places to be, but no. And then you listen to this audio drama in the elevator while you're stuck. You're like, wow, no, okay. no. <laughs> uh, no, I've never been stuck in an elevator somehow, <clears throat> weirdly. I don't think most... Uh, yeah, I think it's a rare occurrence. Anyway, she but, gets stuck yeah. in the Joe elevator. Joe thinks it's pretty suspicious because it is usually a rare occurrence. She's like, oh, no. And then this guy speaks up and he's being pretty shady. He starts narrating uh, Joe's inner thoughts. Yeah. And, and she's like, would you stop that? Right. First, she thinks she's just being annoying. Yeah. And then she realizes he's saying things that he couldn't possibly know without being able to read her mind. Yeah. And she thinks this is pretty shady. And he then reveals himself as Huxley, one of the narrators from Verbatim 6. Right. Um, you know, he, he, he mentions... Mm-hmm. Things about, you know, the doctor that he, that's how she knows, like, hey, how do you know what yeah. who that is? Well, she mentions so, the invasions that the doctor stopped, but doesn't mention that the doctor stopped him because he's trying to convince her of something else. Right. But anyway, he he introduces himself as Huxley from mm-hmm. Verbatim, Verbatim six. 6. Really not not a subtle name there for the planet, but. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> um, I believe this is actually the second appearance of Huxley in the Companion Con, because I haven't heard the first appearance, but he appears yeah. with a fifth doctor companion, I believe. Something like that. Um, but yeah, it's the second appearance. So I guess people who are avidly listening to this video are like, oh yeah, Huxley's back. <laughs> but we were just or, like, or oh, maybe Huxley. they're like, oh darn it, Huxley's back. Or that. He is kind of annoying. <laughs> 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 and, and he's supposed to be, so I guess they succeeded yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, he mentions a bunch of invasions from the 70s, and he's being really cryptic about um, the things that Joe's done in her past. He right. also mentions that he's the one who stopped the elevator, so she's like, oh boy. <laughs> Darn it. <laughs> she thinks he's a serial killer for a bit. Yeah, for some reason. Well, it makes sense if some guy's just in the elevator with you and he, he's the one who sabotaged the elevator and he's kind of shady, hasn't talked to you for the whole ride and starts narrating your whole life. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> uh, but he's like, no, no, nothing like that. I'm just a no- novelizer. Um, he uh, mentions, like, the, the Daleks. Uh, interestingly mentions the Cybermen from Telos which we never saw on screen with Joe and the Doctor. Right, but, you know, that the kind of... The second Doctor was there with Jamie and Zoe. That kind of plays into what into he's doing, later. but also might work against what he's trying to do. Yeah. Well, I'm trying not to give it away, yeah. but... Well, I think I think Joe recognizes everything he's saying is true. All the things he mentions that they've encountered is truth. Right. Um, he so, kind of keeps cryptically also mentioning her, uh, who Joe worked with. Right, she doesn't really know who that is, and eventually she says, how do you know about all my adventures with the Doctor? And I think at this point, Huxley, either he transforms now or he has transformed already, mm-hmm. but he, he loses his human appearance and transforms into a five-legged creature. Um, I don't know, I had trouble picturing that. <laughs> but uh, yeah. it, interestingly enough, uh, and this isn't really that important, but... I imagined his human form. Have you ever read the Tintin comics? Yes. Yeah. I I have, like, all first editions. My dad really loved Tintin. They're in my room, actually. That's cool, interestingly (laughs) enough. But uh, I imagined his human form as uh, Thompson. You know, the Thompson twins? I don't know why, but as soon as he first um, said something, I was just like, yeah, I imagined him as being played by Thompson. Or Thompson, you know? Either or. I almost thought, uh, (laughs) almost... Almost like Hugo Weaving, uh, Agent Smith, like really? in a suit with a tie. Yeah, but he's a comedic character. I imagine as a novelizer, he'd keep himself well dressed. <laughs> he, he want he would want to look. She yeah, she actually mentions that he's got a. Um, she mentions that Huxley's got Huxley has got a, an overcoat on. I think so. At some hmm. point, briefly. <clears throat> Um, but yeah, anyway, he transforms into a five-legged creature, and then the elevator starts going again, past the ground floor into the basement. <laughs> right. And Huxley says, what do you mean you've traveled with the Doctor, Joe? You traveled with... Her. He doesn't mention her name till they get to the, the basement. <laughs> right. And... Because he mean, also tries to p- play up the... Well, they get to the basement, and there's a, there's a double-decker bus there, and I think Joe says something humorous, like, I didn't know there was a car park down here. <laughs> Uh, but there's a double decker bus there, and Huck is like, "Don't you recognize it?" She's like, it, it, "It's a bus. I, of course, I recognize it. There's tons of them." So, um, you know, Huxley mentions that there's someone inside, and then Joe says, "Like <laughs> this line that you know, I think um, 
we both noticed and found humorous, I guess, just based on... Just based... No, it's just... It's a, it's a double entendre, I'd say, is why it was humorous. No, but I mean, is that is that even... Is that term even part of the the British vernacular, verna- vernacular? Is that like a slang term that they use? Or I don't think so. I think, because it was, I think it was designed to be a double entendre. Really? Because Joe says, oh, should I go knock her up? You know, well, I think knock, Huxley, knock the door. Huxley, someone says, should I go knock her up? It was <laughs> Joe. I thought it was Huxley. Because Huxley was like, should I go knock her up? Like, wake her up for Joe? I don't know. Um, I thought well, it was. I, th- a, I thought it was a funny line. It was one of the most memorable lines of the, the play for me, just because yeah. it was kind of a weird line. You know, I just thought it was. You know, maybe slang over there to like you know knock on the door. You know, okay, knock her up. But here, it obviously, means like you know get someone pregnant. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure on that. Maybe I'll look it up. Yeah, po- probably possibly Huxley up. also was just. Or or Joe was just accidentally combining knock on the door and wake her up into into, into one sentence and accidentally ended up with knock her up. <laughs> Either way, it's not really that important. We just noticed it, uh, yeah. so I think we were sort of dwelling on it. But yeah. But anyway, they, they get into the, the bus. Yeah, and it's revealed that it's Iris Wild time, which I already knew. Um, and she's on the cover. Yeah. And, with, and she's with her in face, the blurb with her face obscured. And the doctor's face. Yeah. Good. Um, you might not read the, the blurb. I did. Yeah, Pretty much everyone like, probably does, so... Yeah, the blurb is like, the strange guy is trying to convince Joe that she traveled with Iris Wild Time instead of the doctor, but did she? What's truth and what's fact? And like, okay, whatever. <clears throat> right, so, yeah, that's obviously what Huxley's doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and Iris is like, yeah, you traveled with me, Joe. You don't remember that? We had all those great adventures together. <laughs> And Joe was like, what? And now, hat. And now Joe is just really confused. And I am I honestly was like, are they retconning the third Doctor's era? Like, they are, retconning him out of existence? Was, is this, Did all of that just take place in Joe's mind? Because Huxley does mention altered memories and things like that. And an and organization meow. called we Meow. We didn't mention Meow. <laughs> who has apparently been working behind the scenes and, um, you like know, has altered. The unit. Right. And I guess has altered Joe's memories or something or the other. Apparently, the acronym is actually M I A O W. I guess I just didn't know how to spell incursion, so I thought it was M E O W. Yeah, meow. Uh, but <laughs> best name for an organization, especially a super shady organization. Uh, <laughs> Iris goes back to put some tea on to boo. She puts the kettle on to boil. She comes back and sends Huxley back to check on the kettle and then whispers to Joe, like, I don't believe any of this. I think he's playing us. Uh, but Huxley's like, yeah, I can just vaporize your minds whenever I want, so... <laughs> like, what? <laughs> um, but yeah, they, um... I forget exactly how they do it, but they tie up Huxley. They just kind of They jump, jump him, him, I think. Yeah, I think Joe actually mentions that, come to think of it. You know, she, she's Iris says she's got a plan... And Joe is expecting this elaborate scheme, but no, her plan is just to jump him. Since I was Wild Time, why would you get an elaborate scheme based on everything she's done in this? This is our first exposure to Iris Wild Time, by the way. Um, right. I we know about her. I know you know about more her, about yeah. her. I know you know vaguely what her character is. Yeah, she was introduced in the novels, a novel written by Paul Mars. It's kind of <clears throat> she's kind of Paul Mars's character I, I guess right obviously she's played by katie manning as well yeah joe in is the too audio dramas. so uh, you know that must be fun going back and forth between those two characters and, and yeah. joe act- we'll talk about the developer mm-hmm. not developer interview the yeah the, the little cast crew yeah. interview yeah but um <laughs> basically <laughs> iris is like well we're gonna go back in time now i would try to do her accent but i would just totally butcher it so i'm not <laughs> um she's like get ready for a bumpy landing joe it's, it's a bit of an old ride uh, we should also mention the double decker bus is slightly smaller on the inside, <laughs> unlike the Doctor's TARDIS, which is bigger on the inside. Right. So, part one ends with we're going back to the seventies. <laughs> dun dun dun. Okay. <laughs> right. So they head. Part two begins. Obviously, they head back to the seventies to find out what exactly what's up, exactly what's the truth, and yeah. why maybe why Huxley's doing this. Other than him just being insane, no. Um, <laughs> he is insane. Yeah, they, pretty much. they get there and there's this touching moment where Joe recognizes uh, Yates and Benton, but she's not allowed to show her face because it would be pretty shady if she just showed up uh, at unit. Right. Especially when her younger self is already probably yeah. there wandering around. Yeah. <laughs> so they get they get taken to the jail and then Joe just can't hold it in anymore. She reveals to Benton that she's actually Joe from the future and Benton 
goes along with it. Struggles with himself for a bit and then goes along with it. And then Iris sprays him with her knockout perfume for some reason. <laughs> um, and yeah, right, they escape. And they need to go see the doctor. Oh yeah, Iris has mentioned she's an old fling with the doctors. We should... Right. That confuses Joe for a bit too. <laughs> He's like, wait, what? <clears throat> right, so there's some very pretentious, I thought, not pretentious, but just cringe-inducing, vomit-inducing, whatever you want to call it, narration from Joe where she's... Um, you know, nervous to see the doctor or whatever, or looking forward to seeing him after 40 some years. It's been 40 years, kind of a break. <clears throat> yeah, well, not, that doesn't mean I have to like it. In 40 years, she married to some dude and went down to the Amazon to find fungus. And she <clears throat> came back, she's doing a Christmas shopping. Doesn't she imply that their relationship fell out at some point in this? Wasn't there Maybe? one passing line where she just, where she implies that, <laughs> where she implies that? I don't know. Maybe I'm just reading too much into it. Well, Either before, way, before they get to the doctor, they actually pull the fire alarm so all the unit people would evacuate so they, they can get to the doctor. And right. he's like, wouldn't the doctor evacuate? And Joe's like, no. And he, he would ignore all alarms, which is true <laughs> to his character. But what happens now is actually not true to his character, in my opinion, because, well, Joe has some trouble opening the door. You know, there's this whole long narration where she opens the door and there he is and he's just how he remembers her and I was just about to uh, lose my lunch but um you were, you were listening to this at like 5 at night <laughs> actually like 10 at night but uh Something I was like about it. to lose my dinner let's say <laughs> um I liked the plot of 2 but I do agree the dialogue was a bit lacking in part 2 we'll talk about that in a second um so the, doc- yeah. the doctor and Joe meet um she lunges into his embrace, which is what I can see, them, which they did a lot in the television show. Yeah, I can see it, but, you know, it doesn't mean my, uh, my, you know, never mind, never mind. I'm not uh, going to make any disgusting, you know, imagery here. But. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, Joe and the Doctor kind of have a little reunion of sorts. Little it's, reunion. It's a reunion for Joe, but for the Doctor, he's like, yeah, I just saw you like a little while ago. <laughs> um, but he knows what's going then, on. Then, like, Huxley reveals, like, you told me to do all this, Doctor. And you're like, wait, what? Whoa, hang on, slow down. Right, and I haven't mentioned, but I've, I've I enjoyed the soundtrack to this. Um, yeah, when it, when I noticed it, I guess it was kind of minimal at times. But here, I liked the the you know the little the not, not jingle, but yeah. It, it, I mean, they played some. Uh, they played a little creepy. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know what the term for it is. I'm just, I'm just going to say jingle theme uh, theme here when it was revealed that the doctor was act- mm-hmm. is actually behind all of this. Yeah. Um, and you know I was pretty interested up until this point but you know the reveal here when we find out what actually happens i feel fell flat but i think we have a lot to say about this so we should probably just explain what it is first uh yeah the the doctor eventually gets iris out of the room <laughs> tells her that someone's messing with her beloved bus she's like oh no they're not and she runs out to go chastise the unit soldiers i guess um and then beat the, them off with a stick the doctor explains to joe what his plan was which is basically huxley uh, apparently all the novelizers of verbatim six dream of novelizing someone like uh, or narrating someone like the doctor because he's had so many adventures and the doctor mentions that he's escaped Huxley for a while because he ha- most of the novelizers because he moves around too much but Huxley finally caught up to him because he's been stranded on earth for the past like three years yeah um, so his plan was Iris Wildtime conveniently showed up at the same time so he basically convinced Huxley to follow Iris Wildtime and also convinced him that Joe traveled with Iris instead of the doctor um, or, or convinced him to convince Joe. No, he, 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 as I understood it, was he convinced Huxley that Joe traveled with Iris in the attempt that Huxley would avoid Joe because he, he didn't want Joe, he didn't want Huxley to go after Joe because she traveled with the doctor. Yeah, maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was that was, was, was my understanding of it. And then it kind of backfired because Huxley, because he wanted to know more about Iris, thought he could get to Joe and, and use Joe for information on Iris. So he kind of failed to keep him off of Joe and the Doctor. Yeah, essentially he was, he, um, the Doctor sort of wanted to, I guess, protect Joe and, you know, yeah. not have her, her, um, like, he want, I guess he wanted her to just move on from Unit and, like, their adventures and not really have her in any danger or anything like that. Yeah, I, he, he mentioned that he didn't want Joe to be like too attached to the dog and wanted to move on because he knows that she's gonna have to leave him at some point. Right. Um, so yeah, that's that's the big reveal here. Kind of a letdown, but you know, I'm gonna have a lot to say about this in a minute or two. So we'll Joe's upset at this. 
She yeah, says Joe's some super upset. To the doctor. She says a line which I liked, which is uh, you know something like, "You never realize how important you are, not as the person who saves the world, but just as you." Right. You know, because obviously she says, "You know, I would never want to forget my time at Unit and my mm-hmm. time with you, uh, Doctor." Um, yeah. No matter what, so. Those are some of my favorite lines of part two because part two's lines were all kind of a letdown up to that point <laughs> and were kind of iffy afterwards. But I liked, I liked those. It was a touching moment between Joe and the doctor, I'd say. <clears throat> see, well, see you smoking over there. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. We'll just finish up the plot. Basically, Joe, um, the doctor mentions that Joe needs to go now because um, Joe's about to arrive back with Yates uh, from some other adventure. Right, and that would be pretty bad. If they yeah. met. And he also mentions that he's been... This is at the point where he, he's trying to uh, find out what the Master is up to. So he convinces Huxley to, to go, go a- after, after the, the Master. master. And I want, I, want to see, I want to see that, you know, either in, a, in an audio or maybe mm-hmm. a book. You know, Huxley following the Master. You know, no doctor, no companions involved. That would just be interesting. Yeah, he mentions it's the worst adventure of his entire <laughs> life. But, then he's like, but that's a story for another time. <laughs> and then Huxley doesn't appear for the rest of the story. Um, I think that places this story. I think most people agree this comes uh, before or after the Sea Devils because the monsters escaped from prison, uh, but before the Three Doctors because it has to be before the Doctor escapes his uh, exile. Right. Interestingly enough, I think officially this takes place after Three Doctors. Like, yeah, which which is weird. Weird because but I know, the Doctor's in exile. I think. Right, but I yeah they do specifically mention that. But I know in the commentary at the end they mention. Or maybe not the commentary at the end. Maybe this is just something I read. But, you know, Paul Mars um, didn't really pay too much attention to continuity and just tried to write the story that he wanted to write, which, yeah. you know, I, it's understandable. And I think I think his uh, other... I don't know if it was his other... Uh, the other audio about Huxley, but I, I know one of the, some of his mm-hmm. other things are now considered non-canon because he does that so often. Um, and it's just too confusing, so... Yeah. But, you know, I mean... Can't blame, I can't blame him. There's an official Doctor Who can in anyway. Yeah, but I mean, I don't, I don't blame him, and I don't really care that they yeah, would mess not, something up like this. It's not really that important. Too, I mean, it doesn't like mess up the Doctor's timeline. It doesn't really matter where it takes place anyway. It's kind of a plot that can take place anywhere in the Doctor's timeline, as long as it's post uh, the Doctor meeting them. Post, post the Master fiddling with things on the Earth. And post the Doctor meeting Joe. That's yeah. the big one. Um, but yeah, I'm not super... I'm not one of those guys who's like, oh, I messes with the timeline. This is sucks. This is terrible. Uh, anyway, the, doc- uh, the doctor sends Joe on his way. Joe gets in the bus with Iris. P- presumably <laughs> to get back to 2010, but Iris <laughs> buggers up the controls and they land. Who knows where it ends? I like that. I like the very end where Joe goes off on it. Actually goes off on adventures with Iris now. <laughs> Interestingly enough. There is one audio drama that shows an adventure between Joe and Iris. Uh, it's actually the next... I think it's the next... Companion Chronicle on the line that would feature Joe, just called the Elixir of Doom, uh, was a Joe Iris Wild Time audio, <clears throat> which the Doctor only briefly appears in. It's implied that it's the eighth Doctor that appears in that one. So, right, I, I like uh, I like the setup from. Uh, I liked part, part one. one. Part one set up the mystery really well, and t- uh, when you look back on it, not a lot happened in part one. Mm-hmm. But it was mostly just them explaining things in this roundabout way that, you know, you're trying to wrap your head around it. And it's still really interesting because you're not given all the facts. Yeah. And in, in any sort of order, in any sort of logic order, you got to piece together exactly what's happening. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's so that's why I enjoyed part one. Yeah. And it was just super mysterious, too, which I liked. Then part two just fell flat, in my opinion. Part two, I, I don't know. I think you mentioned the dialogue was worse. I kind yeah. of felt that way, too. Um but really, I just hated this reveal and the plot twist that it was the Doctor behind all of this. Yeah, I, I do think that was a bit d- disappointing. Yeah, I I can't even... I, I think this is just completely out of character for the Doctor. I mean, I know he cares about his companions, but going this far? I mean, really? I could understand him protecting a Doctor. Um, I was reading the forum thread on this uh, audio drama after listening to it, and someone, someone mentioned, like... Um, you know, the Doctor in this feels more almost like uh, the first Doctor, or even like post uh, TV show Seventh Doctor. But he said, but he also said that he couldn't, he couldn't not see the Third Doctor. He couldn't, he could see the Doctor doing these things because he couldn't definitively say that the Third Doctor wouldn't do these, do this under any circumstances. Which I guess I kind of agree with. 
it's a bit extreme for the third doctor you know yeah we did kind of rat on him for being a bit pretentious sometimes but you know even still this feels a bit extreme yeah but other than that boring plot reveal because i was really hoping huxley had some master plan for doing this that didn't involve the doctor and maybe the master was involved which would have been an interesting twist but um I liked the little dialogue between Joe and the Doctor. I mean, not the whole, I'm going to enter the room and see the Doctor again. <laughs> I liked the, I liked her talking to the Doctor for the first time in 40 years. I guess. I mean, the the, the narration seemed, to, to me in part two, to get almost, you know, like fanfic level, you know, maybe written by like a teenage girl. But um, I liked part one. I, I, I thought it was great, the dialogue and stuff. But, mm-hmm. you know, part two was sort of, you know, this just this inner... Yeah. Just this inner, not monologue, but I, mean, I guess it was this inner monologue that I didn't exactly enjoy. Meh. Um, uh, I think it wrap, I think it served as a nice wrap up to Joe, uh, 40 years later. I think it all fit with her character. So I'd say I, I enjoyed this mostly. <clears throat> I have to say that I can't get past what I dislike about this. Um, I think there's, you know, the bad here outweighs the good, in my opinion. So uh, I do like the very end that sets up, you know, Joe's uh, adventures with Iris now that are appa- apparently there's only one of, so. Only uh, one officially. I think uh, there was a bit of a rights dispute between Big, Big Finish and Paul Mars over the character of Iris Wild Time. There was an Iris Wild Time range uh, for Big Finish for a while, which stopped. And the reason why... Iris Wild Time coming back this this month was such a big deal because there hadn't been a wild, Iris Wild Time audio for I think two or three years now because I think they finally settled the the rights uh, kind of thing whatever was going on which is why they chose this audio <laughs> drama to uh, kind of promote Iris Wild Time coming back in action and why we're here talking about this so. precisely um, do you want to talk about the commentary at the, if you don't have anything yeah. else to add about the uh, no I don't have anything audio else itself um well, I mean, Katie Manning was kind of a joy to listen yeah. to in this serial. Uh, I think she's only gotten maybe. I mean, obviously, you know, narrating, reading, voice acting, whatever mm-hmm. is different than acting on mm-hmm. screen. You know, with your entire body in your face. Um, but uh, I think she's gotten better as an actress, probably. Yeah, it's been like forty years since she's been on the show, so. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, and I mean, forty years of acting experience will do that to you. Yeah. Well. Playing, uh, I don't know, it was just interesting to, it was just fun to hear her play Joe and mm. Iris. <laughs> um, it was even more interesting listening to her in the in the interview at the end, uh, when you hear her voice, and it's completely different from both Joe and Iris. And you it's realize, not compl- I mean, it's, it's, it sounded pretty different from the Joe voice to me. It sounded... I, that surprised not, me. It surprised me that she didn't sound exactly like how the Joe voice sounded, because that's how I just imagine she would sound now. You know, I think what I think it was, she probably sounded kind of like that maybe back then, and now yeah. she doesn't. But she, yeah, you know, she went back. She, she, she went put, back to put it. Put the voice on, which, which is what I'm saying. In her interview now, she doesn't sound like Joe at all, which I thought was impressive that she could still put on that basically almost the same voice for Joe. Yeah. Um, but I mean, really, <laughs> and also the Iris voice didn't sound anything like Katie Manning. I, said, <laughs> yeah, I was didn't. really impressed with that voice. Yep. And you know, she. I think she mentions. You know, it's when you're going. When when you're playing two characters talking to each other, it's fun, but you also have to. It's hard to switch back and forth because mm-hmm. you have to completely sw- change your perspective or put yourself in the other character's shoes for for maybe just one yeah. line and then go back to the other character for just one line and you know. Yeah. Um, she I don't know too much doctor about impression it. in there too. Yeah, she um, she does the uh the doctor the third she does actually that I I was impressed by that. The impression she does of Pertwee. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't bad. I mean, it didn't sound too much like Pertwee, but it wasn't uh, bad. I mean, obviously, it, it can't sound bad. exactly like it. It was, <laughs> you know, it was good. I, w- I would go so far as to saying it was, you know, as spot on as she could get it. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I guess people, or I guess, like, you know, people who play companions are pretty good at, you know, putting on. Yeah. Uh, Frazier Hines in the second Doctor. Yep. <laughs> Apparently, Frazier sounds almost exactly like Pat Troughton did back in that day uh, when he does the voice. <laughs> Haven't heard it, but I did hear an interview where <laughs> he was basically like, oh yeah, I did that voice kind of to myself so that I could understand the lines that um, 
I'd be uh, listening to, and they're like, hey, you know, we should just have you do Patrick's <laughs> voice. And he was like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, I enjoyed it. It, the commentary they mentioned possibly a return for Huxley, which didn't happen because the Companion Chronicles reigns ended up being cancelled, uh, I think, a year, maybe two after this one came out. Uh, sadly, I think Big Finish said it just wasn't selling enough uh, for them to keep it viable, so they cancelled it, but there are box sets every year now, so there was a first Doctor box set earlier this year, second Doctor will be coming. can't remember if it's later this year or next year. I think it's next year. Right, but... Hopefully, Huxley will someday return, you know, in some capacity. Hopefully, um, we hear that story with the master. Yeah, that's just what I want to hear. <laughs> uh, it'd, be a, it'd, be, it'd be a good way to get another Roger Delgado story in there without Delgado being around. Yeah, it would. Yeah, uh, <laughs> audio dramas. As your first audio drama, what did you think? Would you uh, listen to more? Definitely. I greatly enjoyed this, and I wouldn't... <laughs> say I enjoy it more than, you know, watching classic who, mm-hmm. um, cause it's definitely different and I don't mm-hmm. think you can, you know, it's not, it's not a one to one comparison that you can make here, right. but, uh, you know, it's something more with a more modern, how do I phrase this? More modern it's, flair. Yeah, exactly. It's nice. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe once we get to the reboot, it's, it, they won't stand out as much like this. Yeah. But, um. Yeah, it was just, it was super interesting, and I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I would. I thought it was going to be like, oh yeah, it's, you know, it's it's going to be stupid, I'm not going to be able to, I like reading, of course, but, mm-hmm. you know, it's, I'm just going to be able to hear them, I'm not really yeah. going to picture anything, but no, it was it was great, I, I loved it. Um, mm-hmm. Just the, picturing what was going on, obviously I didn't care mm-hmm. for the story, but you know, just picturing what was going on, and, uh, mm-hmm. well, I mentioned before, Katie Manning's acting added yeah. to my enjoyment, so... I think it'll be more interesting when we get to like full full cost audio dramas where basically all the surviving actors are still alive, so they don't have to do this narration type thing, and it feels like a story you could watch. Uh, but we'll see if we do more of these. <laughs> see what goes on sale in the next couple months, and what uh, I've already bought. Um, but yeah, email us at the doctor at vegetable.com. Questions, comments, concerns, angry and stuff that is thoughts on find and replace I think by the time this goes out it won't be on sale anymore but you can still pick it up for I think uh, il- uh, actually I think this one will be eight dollars I think the normal price of uh, the companion chronicles range is eight dollars on download 13 on CD if you want to get it on CD uh, some people like the physical thing uh, more than anything else yeah eight dollars 15 on CD by the time this goes out so if you want to pick it up we'll put a link in the description uh check us out on youtube and check us out on itunes leave a rating if you like the show check us out of course on facebook trust your doctor like us on facebook check us out on twitter tyd podcast follow us on twitter and um well we'll see if we do any more of these but until then the end uh.